Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name's Sandy, and I'm an alcoholic. And while Amazing Grace was being sung, I had some faces go before me, and um, I'm just going to mention their names. Those of you that are new, there's a lot of people in here that those names, when I said them, they took deep breaths, because these are messengers that are no longer with us, that were at conferences for a long time. And I used to listen to them. And they just are present here. Because this message that kind of came into being, it's the only way to describe it, it just arrived. I don't think anybody can really take credit for it. I think all of AA is a big happening. And you're part of it now. And it continues on. And what um, you may only have three months today, but what you contribute is going to be felt for years and years later on. And people will have you in their memory as the one that was chosen to bring the message of God to you and to get you out of that hellhole that you've been in all these years. And these names just, um, boy, they were very powerful to me today. And uh, I'll tell you, I'd give half my bank account, or maybe all of it, to do a panel with uh, Scott Redman again, the question and answers. It was just wonderful. It's too bad all of you didn't get to know him. What a character. Oh, what am I supposed to talk about? (laughs) Step 10 and 11. I think I'll use a quote that Ralph used when he was starting his uh, presentation. It was a quote out of the big book. God is everything or he's nothing. He either is or he isn't. That's not the most important thing. The next sentence is, what is your choice going to be? And the choice you make will control your relationship with God. So if you approach steps 10 and 11 with the thought that God is everything, they're going to mean something entirely different than if you approach them as, well, these are the things you teach the next guy or gal on how to get sober. There's a world of difference. And one accomplishes wonderful things and other people get sober and people will say, that's wonderful, you carried the message. And um, I know I did that for a long time and I, I remember saying to myself, I'm sure God really likes this. I'm sure it's making him happy. What he really would like is some attention from me. That's what he'd really like. And he'd like me to spend a lot of time with him. And then he will make carrying the message to other people a piece of cake. You won't even have to think about it. You won't even have to prepare. You would just get up. and. um, So to me, this is uh, why these steps are so important. uh, And we've done a lot of work to get here. You could say that all the work, if you want to call it that, has been done by the time we get to step 10. And the reason I say that is because it doesn't take long in the big book before you get to the sentence that says, we have entered the world of the Spirit. Well, that's not where we started. (laughs) We were in the world of the spirits, but we weren't in the world of the Spirit. So what does that mean, that we're in the world of the Spirit? And have we noticed it? 
Sometimes the transformation spiritually that takes place in AA members is noticed by others before they notice it themselves. And so they give us a few hints. Have you noticed that um, you don't think about yourself as much as you used to? Have you noticed that your outlook and attitude has changed since you got here? Is your whole attitude and outlook about everything different than when you got here? Well, how the hell did that happen? What caused that? Just because you're not drinking, that changed that? Have you noticed that your fear about things is considerably less and may, in fact, not be dominating you anymore? You're not, you're, you're, here you are in this great big crowd. You didn't like crowds at all when you got here. You couldn't stand it. You were all loners. Now you're gossipers. Hey, hi, hi, hi. You're, <laughs> What is that? Did fear of people start leaving? How did it happen? Where did it go? When we go through the promises in the ninth step, and then more as we come into this tenth step, it's describing a spiritual awakening. It's breaking down the components of a profound transformation into little pieces so that we can't miss it. My favorite is self-seeking will slip away. What a verb to describe making progress. All I do is think about myself, don't worry, it'll slip away. (laughs) Really? Is that a Freudian term or a (laughs) Carl Jung come up with that? What What are you talking about? You'll notice that the verbs in the promises are could be better used by a magician because it's magic. It's a miracle. There's no explanation for why you're more comfortable. There's no explanation for... And what does it say at the end of them? They will always materialize if we work for them. Right before your eyes, they're going to materialize. So we're describing something that is beyond human capability of producing. And it's happening inside of you. And sometimes we need sponsors to point it out because we're so used to thinking negatively that we haven't noticed we're happy. (laughs) People come to me and say, I'm having a bad day. I said, are you sure? Have you, have you checked? Let's look at it together. And a lot of times when we get through, they go, God, I was wrong. I'm not having a bad day. I'm just so used to telling myself I'm having a bad day. I believe it. So you can see something is going on that is, um, the whole point of Alcoholics Anonymous is to have this event take place in our lives so that after making all these amends and doing all the inventory and working so hard on step six and seven, something of major significance happens and we're now coming into unfamiliar territory, which is the world of the spirit. We're very familiar with the material world and what counts and what is important and all of that. But now we've got a chance to take steps for leaving this material world and spend more time in this world of the spirit. But to live there, you can't follow the same, you know, it's like going to uh, Japan. You've got to drive on the other side of the street. It's different ways of living. And so it is in the world of the spirit. Because here, God is everything. And it is really all about God. And I remember when I was new, someone said, it's all about God. Yeah, isn't it God? It's really great. And I'm going, 
hey, enough of the God stuff. What about me? I'm out here too, you know. Let's get this conversation back to something important. <laughs> and it would rub me the wrong way to hear God, God, God. Well, if something took me up and lifted me out of the place I'd been for all those years, I finally realized I ought to try and spend as much time as possible with whatever this power is and get to know it better. And if I do that, I will be remarkably useful to this power in helping others have the same relationship. You see, if we just help people get sober, we'd be selling them short. Sober is not drinking. That's great. It's, you know, you could say, well, yeah, I've got pretty good sobriety. If somebody said that about me, I'd punch him. <laughs> yeah, he's got pretty good sobriety. It's almost an insult <clears throat> when we're talking about what's available. Do you follow what I'm saying? It's just why would we settle for pretty good sobriety? That would be cheating ourselves out of what's really here, which is these fourth dimension experiences and uh, Chuck Chamberlain was such a speaker on these issues. And so the tenth step just is we're inventorying where are you right now? And then as we look at these promises and we start looking about in the tenth step where it's uh, talking about <clears throat> we rarely think about drinking anymore. If, uh, if, uh, if we have a thought about grabbing a drink and we go, oh God, I can't touch that like it was a hot flame. You know the stuff in there? It's just reminding us, do you see the difference now? Do you see? First time I started to get a glimpse of what was going to happen in this spiritual world was, I told my sponsor, I've been sober about four months, and I said, God, I think something's wrong with me. And he said, what? And I said, I forgot to think about drinking last week. And he said, wow, that's really, t uh, we better investigate that. Do uh, you think something's going wrong with your mind? You've thought about drinking for 30 years, and you forgot to think about it last week. How did you do that? And I remember going, I didn't do it. It just happened. <laughs> did you ever try to not think about drinking <laughs> on your own? This drinking is haunting me. I'm going to stop. I'm not going to think about drinking. That's it. I'm going to think about, oh, the exit sign. Look at that. Budweiser. Oh, shit. Okay, I'll start over again. <laughs> you could no more stop thinking about drinking <laughs> than you could stop breathing. And yet you forgot last week. We need help in somebody pointing out, I think something spiritual happened. Let's see you go to a therapist and have him help you stop thinking about drinking. Now I think about two things, his bill and drinking. So, <laughs> so all I'm doing is, <clears throat> is setting the stage for, we got to inventory where we are as we come into this 10th step because inventory is part of maintaining spiritual condition. Inventory, prayer, and meditation. <clears throat> And so it says that we have been placed in a position of neutrality. I mean, what a beautiful word. The war inside of us has been called off. We are now neutral. We're neutral on issues. Huh? I think I'll just go think about things and relax. We almost are getting into a no opinion on outside issues. Now I'm kind of neutral on that. What a freedom that is. That is the peace that is we can't imagine we would ever have. And then it goes on to say that we are not cured of alcoholism. We have a daily reprieve. So today, if you want to be free of alcohol, just 
maintain the spiritual condition that arrived as you entered the tenth step or improve on it. And you will have day after day where you are never tormented about thinking about a drink or having a drink. A daily reprieve, contingent on our spiritual condition. So now we get into the discussion of what is, uh, how do you maintain your spiritual condition? I used to, I didn't like prayer and meditation, so I thought I could maintain it by taking meetings to detoxes. And I told myself, this is making God very happy, and I am obviously a spiritual person because I'm doing this. But it doesn't say that that's anything about that in this spiritual world. It talks about prayer and meditation. And it talks about inventory. And it talks about always being aware that everything you have came from God. If we do not keep that awareness, we're going to take credit for it. I'll guarantee you, you will suddenly be patting yourself on the back for not drinking. And express your gratitude to all the forces that there were, God included, for placing you in a much stronger position where you are no longer the same person you were when you came in, much less vulnerable to drinking. And mostly we have prayers of, thank you, God, for making me so strong I barely need you. We don't even realize it's happening because we're neglecting the instructions in the 10th step in the big book. When anything comes up, this is the whole game plan for the spiritual world. Whatever comes up, resentment, fear, anxiety, We ask God at once to remove them. Okay, um, are there any questions on how the spiritual world operates? (laughs) The reason I'm saying that is that somebody, you're going to get here and you're going to start getting anxious and you're going to call your sponsor and go, I'm anxious. What should I do? Well, did you ask God to remove it? Oh, that probably doesn't work. So what do you think I ought to do? We hate simplicity. We hate that this is going to be the answer from now on. God's going to be the answer. We just hate that. It's impossible that there's just one answer for all problems. Well, what were you doing before you got here? What problem did you have that you didn't drink over? The... The answer to all my problems was, wait a minute, let me get a drink. I'll be right back and we'll, I'll figure this out and it'll take very little time. And so the 10th step is very clear that now it's all about staying plugged in to this power that transformed us. That's our new understanding of this word God. The Whatever it was that caused me to be transformed, that's who I'm talking about. The 12 and 12 has um, some very practical thoughts. And by the way, if you're new, I'm the type of person who takes people through the steps with both books open at the same time. Because I just personally feel there's a lot of value in both of them. So why leave one out? And they're both written by the same author. And the second one, he had 10 or 12 more years of sobriety. Not that that would affect anything. <laughs> so the big book thumpers now are all resentful, but I can't help it. <laughs> we'll be... Touching on your problem in a second. (laughs) Oh, 
Oh, I forgot. If you haven't read the 12 and 12, you never heard of the spiritual axiom. <laughs> Can you erase that, Lee? I didn't mean to. Put... <laughs> <laughs> the 12 and 12 suggests that um, inventory is incredibly important in this maintaining of spiritual condition. And it really is. We're, but we're inventorying not how much money we have in the bank and whether we're going to get promoted. We're inventorying our own spiritual condition. Generally, it consists of what is ruining our spiritual condition. What is it about me that has got me upset? And so we look at the day that we're about to face or at the other end, we review the day. And it's all done in order to see how we could have been in harmony on a more frequent basis. Gee, that first run-in in the office with that new guy that came in, how could I have done that better? Let's take, how about take two on running into the guy at the office this morning? So now we go back and we can reenact it. Well, if I come in, I'm not going to say, the Yankees lost again, you know, because he was a Yankee fan. Maybe I could start with a different greeting. <laughs> you see, this is the type of activity that selfish alcoholics don't engage in. We just resent the Yankee fan and leave it at that. Do you follow what I'm saying? So it is inventory is so essential on a constant basis. So much so that Bill comes up with the spot check inventory and the, which is to be taken every time we're disturbed. But we're going to be busy, aren't we? <laughs> that side of the room bothers me and so does that side. I'm going to... If there's a, a guideline that comes out of the 12 and 12, as we march through the day's journey, when you get disturbed, stop. Do not go any further. You are going to screw something up, if you do, <laughs> that will probably involve an amend. Stop. It's almost like letting go. It's the same phenomenon. Let go. Every disturbance should be treated like a hot coal in your hand. Oh, my God, this thing is burning me. Stop, stop. So he, he teaches us to look at it from the perspective of a spiritual axiom, and I have no idea where it came from. That's probably somebody's thing. They can look up where that came from. Um. If something disturbs us, no matter what the cause, there's something wrong with us. That is not the ending that we would have put on <laughs> on our own. If something disturbs us, find out who the jerk is that caused it and get him. That would be what I think it, we would have written. But instead it says there's something wrong with us. Well, the guy comes in. He insults me in front of the whole office. What? What's my part? I was sitting at my desk. I didn't even look up. He just comes in. Boom. So what's my part? You're disturbed. Oh, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, wouldn't everybody? Yeah, they might, yeah. Well, I don't get it. Well, you had the power to get undisturbed. Oh. Well, technically that might be a solution, but... <laughs> I mean, if you want to be intellectual and all that, I, um, that obviously eliminates revenge and things like that. So I don't know if I really want to put being undisturbed on such a high level since I spent most of my life very disturbed. I'm just a little more familiar with that than this undisturbed thing. 
And if you have a good sponsor, you'll just keep undisturbed is the same as if it never happened. It becomes irrelevant. Undisturbed is the same as if it never happened. The guy says, blah, 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 and we go, what would you say? I'm sorry, I missed it. It doesn't ruin our whole day. Now, how would you like the power to have that happen? See, the power we wanted before was to shut his mouth. But this is different. In the spiritual world, it all involves changing us, adjusting, becoming a small target, becoming almost the hole in the donut, so small that things can hardly find an ego to hit. Because the only target is our ego. And if it's so small, and this is what this is all about. So what do we do about it? There's, I always like to cover this little four-step plan. First of all, the top priority is self-restraint. The provocation occurs. We have to have prayed ahead of time for five-second cushion before we do anything. That saves a great number of things from happening. Self restraint. The boss comes in and he says, did you write this memo, Ralph? Yeah, I did. This sucks. This is the worst memo that's ever been written in this office. The words come across the room into Ralph's ears and he goes, screw you. Those words are now coming back to the boss and Ralph is trying to grab the words before they get there. But he can't. You're fired. And later on at the bar, we're going, yeah, the guy said that in front of, oh, God, I, you should have punched them. Because <laughs> bars don't have a large collection of spiritually advanced people. So <laughs> they're going, they're going to give you different feedback than you get in here. And your sponsor goes, you know, if you could have kept your mouth shut, this might have had a different ending. (laughs) So let's assume we can keep our mouth shut. We can avoid restraint of tongue and pen. God, with email, I'm glad we didn't have email when I was working. (laughs) For the little ups and, oh boy. I bet there's alcoholics getting in trouble all over the place out there. How do you get that back from 7,000 people? (laughs) So, assuming that we have this quality called self-restraint, we will find that the uh, temperature drops rapidly after a couple minutes, and now we're not furious, we're disturbed. We're still upset about it. The next thing we need is called an honest analysis of what happened. This generally involves outside help. (laughs) An analysis made while semi-disturbed may come out in our favor every time. So a sponsor, a spiritual advisor, something like that. I have friends that I call, and when I say, can I run something by you, even if they're at their office, they know we're talking about 45 seconds. And then I go, okay, my boss came in this morning. I was sitting there. He said, did you write this memo in front of everyone? And then he he went, well, this is the worst memo. This really sucks. It really sucks. And my sponsor goes, okay, let me think about it. Wow. Your boss is totally at fault. He is absolutely unreasonable for a human being to do what that man did to you this morning. So forgive him. (laughs) Isn't he going through a divorce? Or or is he the one, one of his children is quite ill? Yeah, yeah, he's really worried about his daughter. Yeah. Well, you think maybe he's not his normal? Yeah, he probably, yeah. Yeah, maybe I could let him off the hook. 
Well, if you let them off the hook, you're going to be undisturbed again. As a matter of fact, you're going to feel real good about yourself. You're just going to go, wow, I like that. On the other hand, with the event that happens the next day, whatever it might be, we might call our sponsor and go, well, same boss, I can't believe it. the whole thing. And he goes, well, Sandy, that one's 100% your fault. Read the memo. I read it to him. That memo does suck. Well, can't you? <laughs> you wrote that? Well, I was in a hurry. I wanted to get home early. I was just right there. Well, you write a better memo, and you go up and tell him you're so sorry you gave him that piece of crap, and you're going to give him a much better memo. You're going to make amends to him. <sighs> And when you do, you're going to feel wonderful. And there it is. Self-restraint, honest analysis, willingness to forgive, willingness to make amends. Why do we want this plan? We want this plan because the rules have been changed. Do you want to be a winner? Yes, we all want to be a winner. Well, in the past, the winner was whoever got promoted. The winner was whoever got the most money. The winner was the one with the biggest car. On the new game you're in now, the winner is the least disturbed. That's the new winner. That's what we're going for. I, and in my home group, I was the least disturbed today. That's called showing off spiritually. <laughs> you follow what I'm saying? There's two ways to show off spiritually. Be the least disturbed. And when you make comments at discussion meetings, you talk the least. Oh, it kills him. It just kills him. You say everything that needs to be said in two sentences and pass. Boy, it kills. The, they just can't stand it. They just can't stand it. Okay, so this gives us some very practical instructions and guidelines on how to stay connected in the day at a time tenth step. The tenth step is really how do you live a day at a time? And you can see being undisturbed is really one of the main ingredients. You have to be in the now and be undisturbed to have any conscious contact. You have to be in the now and be undisturbed to have any conscious contact. You will not have this wonderful relationship with God while you're furious at anything. So being getting the handle on, get over it, get over it, get over it, let it go, let it go, let it go, is how you win. It's so contrary to survival instincts and everything. But this is, so then it says, continuing to inventory, Sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry it out. So the only two suggestions on how to improve conscious contact are prayer and meditation. Not 12-step calls. Not sponsoring. Not name all the activities. Not being the GSR. Not being, those are wonderful. Those are extensions of God having us be useful. But if we're not connected to God, we're thinking up where we ought to be. We're deciding what useful activity I will engage in. And I will grant you that it contributes mightily to the well-being of Alcoholics Anonymous, but it does not advance your spiritual condition. That's a terrible thing to find out, isn't it? For those of us that like to be busy, 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 busy and go to bed at night going, I'm sure God loved what I did today. (laughs) Did you ask him? No, I I just know. I can tell. I can tell. He's happy. I can tell. I don't really spend much time with him. I spend time in service for him. Really? Does he know about it? (laughs) Having been here. When I took my inventory on that, it just floored me. I was on a much higher pedestal than I was after I finished. (laughs) 
So through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact. Whenever I see the words conscious contact, I think of Chuck Chamberlain and the simplicity of his entire teachings, which he reduced down to there's only one problem that includes all problems, conscious separation from God. And there's only one solution that includes all solutions, conscious contact with God. In a state of conscious contact, problems cannot exist. That's why it's the solution to all problems. And on the contrary, conscious separation from God opens the door to all the other problems. But when we analyze them, whether they're financial, sexual, uh, emotional, physical, they only can exist if we have conscious separation. Even physical. I had a lot of physical pain in the last six or seven years. And when I would focus on my spiritual condition instead of the pain, the pain was dropped immeasurably. And so it's such a simple thing, conscious contact and conscious separation. So here's an opportunity to improve conscious contact. Conscious contact is working on all your problems at once. You see the difference? Instead of going, well, I have a relationship thing. I'm going to talk about relationships. I'm going to talk about that. Okay. A lot of good stuff can come out of that. We can get a lot of practical advice on what to do and not to do, etc. But if we were working on conscious contact, we might not need to have the discussion. Because we would intuitively be given guidance that is precious. So there's the two. And the ego isn't involved in conscious contact. It doesn't get to think about things. It doesn't get to play a big role. So do you want God to help you? You want to try and figure it out yourself. I'll, I'll figure it out myself and I'll go to him if I screw up. Does everybody have that tendency? I'll figure it out myself. And then I'll call on God if I happen to need him. I don't want to get him tired as billions of people that he has to work with. The human tendency is... Oddly enough, to use God as a last resort instead of a permanent home. And so this is where, when we get the 11th step, this is an individual adventure. This is not a we program now. This is you deciding what that sentence at the um, end of three pertinent ideas means when it said God couldn't would if he were sought. It is encouraging us to become God-seeking missiles. That can be our priority. Now, it looks like if I'm going to take my energy and my attention and focus on this search for God, I'm ignoring everything over here. (laughs) I'm not ignoring everything over here. I'm turning it over while I come over here and I get this Closer contact. I get this closer relationship. Then I turn back. (laughs) Wow, somebody's been working on that big mess. (laughs) Look at that. Look at that. This is what let go and let God means. The child wants the mother to help her with the yarn that got all screwed up. But she wants to participate helping her mother with the yarn. And Finally, the mother goes, give me the damn thing. (laughs) You have to turn the whole thing over if you want God to work on it. He doesn't want you going, no, God, don't you think it would be better if you... (laughs) Go to the movies. That's I tell my everybody I sponsor when they have these problems, I say, what are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm going to worry about this. No, you go to the movies, and when you get there, look at your watch, See how long the movie goes. As you're going in, tell God, God, look, I'm going to stop working on all this stuff that's important. 
The movie's two hours and 11 minutes. Can you watch it for two hours and 11 minutes while I go to the movies? I'll be out and grab it right back, I promise. I'll, I'll grab it all when I come out. You will take it? Okay. It's like a babysitter or something. Okay, okay. And you go in and you enjoy that movie. If you can sit there and go, yeah, oh, wow, wee, wow. And then come out. Okay, God, you're going to get back. Whoa. This guy does good work. This is amazing. What got changed? This situation didn't get changed. Your perspective, your perception of it was transformed by letting it go. It was transformed. So this whole thing, you know, in the beginning it says we pick up this kit of spiritual tools. You remember that in the beginning of the big book? we got to remember these are power tools. They have to be plugged in. They don't work if they're not plugged in. That's a you tool. I'm going to, I'm going to ruin my own resentment. So it's very important that we see this. All right. So I would add contemplation to the 11th step. We, where you simply sit and reflect on the wonders of the universe. You go down to some peaceful park near your house. And you just sort of sit there and just go, I wonder how this whole thing got started. I just, and kind of experience the wonder of it. And just sort of be like a tree or whatever, just sitting there and, well, the wind's blowing and this this is happening. And boy, for some, this get, for this to even be put together is, it's unbelievable. And I remember when I used to say to myself, I'd sit there for, 20 or 30 minutes. And then I'd stand up and my cynical self would say, well, back to the real world. And I really should have been saying, well, it's time to leave the real world and go into the world of illusion and go into the make-believe world, go into the world of the stories, go into the world of the resentments, go back into the... The world I created in my own mind. Go back to the perception that has me as the center of everything. Go back into old ideas. Go back in, and I call it the real world. I just left the real world. All that's being suggested is that we spend more time in the real world. It's ours. It was created for us. I'm sure God's going, hey, have you guys noticed what I put together for you to enjoy? Now I gotta get my brother-in-law, I gotta get even with him. I'll look at it later, God. I'm... <laughs> this is all for you guys. I mean, we got um, rivers and canyons and oceans. It was a major undertaking to put this whole universe together and have you noticed it? No, but I noticed my brother-in-law. I, I, I... <laughs> I didn't miss him. Oh, you, you, you've got a clear focus on your brother-in-law and missed the universe. Wow. Oh, okay. Um, whatever you want to focus on. God is everything or he's nothing. What's your choice? My choice today is my brother-in-law. <laughs> I honestly believe that free will only extends to one choice. That's it. We don't have any other free will. We either choose God or we don't. If we choose God, God's in charge, so we don't need our free will anymore. If we don't choose God, our character defects are in charge. Not us. So we're going to do whatever lust and greed and envy and anger and frustration tell us to do. I know you weren't planning on this, Ralph, but I want you to go over and punch Mary in the stomach. That was our anger. We weren't, we didn't choose to do that. We may be held accountable for it, but we didn't choose it. So when Ralph read that, what's your choice to be? Here's where we start making the most important choice of our life. How much time are we going to spend seeking? How much time are we going to spend on prayer and meditation? How much time are we going to spend on the prayer of St. Francis, studying about St. Francis? What an amazing person. Absolutely amazing. Went through that hellish kind of a life 
and then decided that he could be the most useful if he could get rid of his ego by depriving himself of worldly things in order to enter the world of the spirit. And the more he did it, the more people wanted to just hang around him to feel the energy. And you say, well, what did he contribute? <laughs> I, I can't think of how you could contribute more. It ended up with this prayer where he said, here, I, this is what it took me years to come up with this, to have this revealed to me. This is what you really ought to pray for. You really ought to pray to become a channel. You really ought to pray to be able to bring harmony where there's discord, to bring love where there's hatred, to bring forgiveness. This is what you really ought to pray for. Because if you do, you will be so happy. If prayer does not look like one that makes you happy, does it? Everything in the spiritual world is, doesn't look like it should work. It doesn't look like it should work. So you have to try it. You have to try it yourself. You have to buy a book on meditation. You have to look in the paper. Oh, there's somebody coming teaching a class. I'm going to take myself there. I'm going to sit and see what this guy's talking about. And then your ego's going, are you kidding? The Falcons are playing. You're going to go sit during a Falcon game? Some goofball is going to tell you to shut your eyes and breathe? Are you kidding? <laughs> Who the hell do you think you are? Those are the struggles that are going to go on to keep us from what was intended for us. Here is the universe. Here's the whole world. Come on up and take it. I'm dealing with my brother-in-law. I'll come up and get it later. Do you see what I'm saying? This is why it's so hard. It's a gift. AA is a gift. The 11th step is a gift. Just claim it. Hey, has that got my name on it? Yes. Well, come up and get it. Come up and it'll be handed to you. Bill Rice in the 12 and 12, the spiritual awakening. It's a gift, but we have to prepare ourselves to receive it. That's all we have to do. We have to have the door open so that when it arrives, it can come through. So it's time to quit. And I, I just want to tell you how much of an honor it is to um, talk about these type of matters. This kind of stuff you can't work into normal conversations. <laughs> <clears throat> I live in a condo, and I, I know some of the people. Most everybody knows in AA, and I know if I went to the pool and sat there and said, Hey, gang, how you doing? Have you thought about contemplation at all today? And <laughs> Have you thought about this? Would you like to hear about the 11th step? Would you like to hear about blah, blah, blah? You would be branded as weird. I mean, that's just the way it is. And so the struggle, if you're new is that you're going to look different. You simply are. You're going to be the peacemaker at the office. And you're going to talk freely about spiritual matters where you may receive criticism for doing it. Well, keep doing it anyway. Because there may be one person in your office, alcoholic or non-alcoholic, whose life you change because you didn't back down. And that's all that really matters. So when the serenity prayer says we need some courage, we ensure need it here. To be a, to live a spiritual life, to really sincerely try it, is going to receive backlash. Because it just, I'll give you a good example. Dick had another convention that was here. And they were going to mix something. I forget when they were going to do it. And Dick said, are you sure you want to have a group of people having a cocktail party with AA right next to him? Don't you think AA will ruin the cocktail party? It would. Sober people, AA members, going to a football game with a bunch of drinkers 
It doesn't fit sometimes. The, the last guy I wanted to be around was somebody who wasn't drinking. And the last guy I wanted to be around when I was uh, new was somebody talking about God all the time. I didn't want to hear it. And so I don't know how many times God's in the big book and the 12 and 12, but I'm sure it's a couple hundred. It's obviously the solution to every problem we have in life. And uh, that's all I can say. Thank you all very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.